under. I wish to present some material that in my mind quite shows quite conclusively that not only are we being lied to about uh, the Iran and the attacks on these tankers, but in fact that these plans have been around for quite a long time. We are, I think, all aware of the neocon plans to bring down seven countries in seven years as laid out by General Wesley Clark. But I would like to go back to 2003 to show Bibi Netanyahu of Israel lying in the run-up to war in Iraq. And if he was doing it then, why wouldn't he be doing it now? Which in fact we know he is. So let's go first of all to this. If you take out Saddam, Saddam's regime, I guarantee you that it will have enormous positive reverberations on the region. And I think that people sitting right next door in Iran, young people, uh, and many others will say, the time of such regimes, of such despots, is gone. There is a new age. Something new is happening. And that Iran, is speculation on your part, or you have uh, some evidence to that effect? The way to deal with uh, terrorist uh, regimes, well, the terror was to deal with the terrorist regimes. And the way to deal with the terrorist regimes, among other things, was to uh, apply military force against them. To the way we did, I guess I'm running out of time, so I quickly was trying to get there. We've done, I think, what you propose in Afghanistan, yet I haven't seen that sort of neighborhood effect. Well, I think, I think there's been an, an enormous effect. Uh, the effect was, we were told that there would be uh, a contrary effect. First of all, people said that there would be tens of thousands of people streaming into Afghanistan, zealots who would be outraged by America's action, and this would produce a counter-reaction in the Arab world. But I think you're not saying that when you take an action like we did in Afghanistan, we're going to see all the other countries just fall. No, what we saw is something else. First of all, we saw everybody streaming out of Afghanistan. The second thing we saw is all the Arab countries and many Muslim countries trying to side with America, trying to make to be okay with America. The application of power is the most important thing in winning the war on terrorism. If I had to say, what are the three principles of winning the war on terror? It's like, what are the three principles of real estate, the three L's, location, location, location? The three principles of winning the war on terror are the three W's, winning, winning, and winning. The more victories you amass, the easier the next victory becomes. The first victory in Afghanistan makes the second victory in Iraq that much easier. The second victory, in Iraq will make the third victory that much easier too, but it may change the nature of achieving that victory. It may be possible to have implosions taking place. I don't guarantee it, Mr. Turney, but I think it makes it more likely. So there we are. Um, yeah, I wonder what you'd say about um, defeat, because in each of those, of course, it's, it's been a case of defeat. So um, let's go to this next one. Uh, now we have uh, this uh, chap from the uh, Washington Institute uh, openly saying that we need a false flag to get, that the US needs a false flag to get the war that it wants. So let's just play this. I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough. And it's very hard for me to see how the United States... Uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Um, which leads me to conclude that if, in fact, compromise is not company, that the traditional way of Amer America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into the World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall they had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, yes. until the Maine exploded. And may I point out that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing, which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. One can combine other means of pressure with sanctions. Uh, I mentioned that explosion uh, on August 17th. Uh, we could step up the pressure. 
I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? We can do a variety of things if we wish to increase the pressure. I'm not advocating that. But I'm just suggesting that uh, it, it, it's, this, this is not a, a either-or proposition. Of, you know, it's just sanctions has to, has to succeed or other things. We are in the game of using covert means against the Iranians. We, we could get nastier at that. So there we are. Um, and by the way, um, this chap is... Still very much in business, Patrick Clawson is his name, the Morningstar Senior Fellow and Director of Research, and there's even a telephone number uh, here. So, um, yeah, well, there we are. Um, so I want to go on. Um, uh, Caitlin Johnson has done a wonderful piece of journalism, and I will post the link to this in the description box below on the seven reasons to be highly sceptical of the Gulf of Oman incident. So I will just uh, go through these um, one by one, but without the information. You can read the article yourself. So she says her seven reasons are Pompeo is a known liar, especially when it comes to Iran. The US Empire is known to use lies and false flags to start wars, and we just saw evidence of that just uh, before. John Bolton has openly endorsed lying to advance military agendas. Using false flags to start a war with Iran is already established idea in the DC swamp. We'll come to that in a minute. The US State Department has already been running PSYOPs to manipulate the public Iran narrative. The Gulf of Oman narrative makes no sense. And even if Iran did perpetrate the attack, Pompeo would still be lying. So I thoroughly recommend that you uh, read this article. Okay, and then the next thing, uh, last night, I heard this wonderful piece. It was an hour long um, from the last American Vagabond, and it was a great, uh, um, um, great discussion of events. And he's divided that up into several interviews um, uh, looking at uh, specific uh, things. So I just want to concentrate on this. Path to Persia, the 2009 US document that outlines how to manipulate Americans into war with Iran. Um, so he cites an article by Tony Cartolucci, who's written uh, an article just uh, recently about this, but then also back in, I think, uh, 2011, he wrote quite um, widely on this. He wrote a series of two articles. Um, but this is just to put, not in any particular order, some of the key points of what uh, the, uh, the last American vagabond said. So the way to avoid international criticism and maximize support is only to strike when there is widespread conviction that the Iranians would reject a perfect deal. The problem is that everybody, apart from the US and Israel, recognizes that Iran never violated the deal, but they need us to think that Iran rejected the deal. You have to wait to strike uh, until you've got the popular support and the support of the international community. And the United States or Israel, or whoever carries out the attack, has to be seen as taking military action in sorrow, not in anger. So, at least some in the international community would conclude that Iran had brought it upon themselves by refusing what was a very good deal. And of course, they were talking about this in 2009, but of course, we can see that the very good deal was the, uh, I can't remember the acronym, but the, uh, the, um, the deal that was made uh, under the Obama administration. 
So the policy is to goad Iran into war, and you could say that for Russia as well. The secret is to make it seem as though we're not goading them into war. It has to seem that the US is not goading them, or the plan might backfire. And I hope that is exactly what is happening. Washington would take actions to ensure that Iran is goaded into war, in other words, a false flag. I give recognition to the fact in the paper that I'm about to talk about that Iran has been reluctant to take any form of aggressive action in the past. And as Iran has chosen not to take the bait, the responsibility is on the US to actually do something. Oh dear. So I just want to, I need to, somehow this always happens. Um, so this is the paper and I suggest uh, I'm going to uh, provide a link to it so you can go and uh, look at it yourself. So I'm going to go through um, some of the points uh, that are in this paper. I've got this off a, uh, an article by Tony uh, Cartolucci. Unfortunately, some of the slides that I've presented have, uh, for some reason, uh, disappeared. So I had to bring them back again. So uh, there might be some things that are missing from this presentation. So here goes uh, some examples. So this is, I think, the main thing that uh, goading provocations for an airstrike. It would be far more preferable if the United States could cite an Iranian provocation as justification for the airstrikes before launching them. Clearly, the more outrageous the more deadly and the more unprovoked the Iranian action, the better off the United States. In other words, the, uh, the neocons would be. Of course, it would be very difficult for the United States to goad Iran into such provocation without the rest of the world recognizing this game, which would then undermine it. One method that would have some possibility of success would be to ratchet up covert regime change efforts in the hope that Tehran would retaliate overtly or semi-overtly, which could then be portrayed as an unprovoked act of Iranian aggression. And they seem to have been singularly incapable of doing that this far. This suggests that this option might benefit from being held in abeyance until such time as the Iranians made an appropriately provocative move as they do from time to time. In that case, it would be less a determined policy to employ airstrikes and instead more of an opportunistic hope that Iran would provide the United States with the kind of provocation that would justify airstrikes. However, that would mean that the use of airstrikes could not be the primary US policy towards Iran, even if it were Washington's fervent preference, but merely an ancillary contingency to another option that would be the primary policy, unless or until Iran provided the necessary pretext. And on sanctions, for those who are favor regime change or a military attack on Iran, either by the United States or Israel, there's a strong argument to be made for trying this option first. Inciting regime change in Iran would be greatly assisted by convincing the Iranian people that their government is so ideologically blinkered that it refuses to do what is best for the people and instead clings to a policy that could only bring ruin on the country. The ideal scenario in this case would be that the United States and the United International Community present a package of positive inducements so enticing that the Iranian citizenry would support the deal only to have the re regime reject it. In a similar vein, any military operation against Iran will likely be very unpopular around the world 
and require the proper international context, both to ensure the logistical support the operation would require and to minimise the blowback from it. The best way to minimise international opprobrium and maximise support, however grudging or covert, is to strike only when there is widespread conviction that the Iranians were given, but then rejected, a superb offer. One so good that only a regime determined to acquire nuclear weapons and acquire them for the wrong reasons would turn it down. Under those circumstances, the United States or Israel could portray its operations as taken in sorrow, not anger, and at least some in the international community would conclude that the Iranians brought it on themselves by refusing a very good deal. So all of this is from a, um, a pretty official um, uh, policy statement justifying invasion. If the United States were to decide that to garner greater international support, galvanize US domestic support, and or provide a legal justification for an invasion, it would be best to wait for an Iranian provocation. Then the time frame for an invasion might stretch out indefinitely, with only one real exception, since the 1978 revolution, the Islamic Republic has never willingly provoked an American military response, although it has certainly taken actions that could have done so if Washington had been looking for a fight. Thus, it is not impossible that Tehran might take some action that would justify an American invasion, and it is certainly the case that if Washington sought such a provocation, it could take actions that might make it more likely that Tehran would do so, although being too obvious about this could nullify the provocation. However, since it would be up to Iran to make the provocative move, which Iran has been very aware of doing so uh, most times in the past, the United States would never know for sure when it would get the requisite Iranian provocation. In fact, it might never come at all, so they have to uh, create it. A foreign funded color revolution. Finding and building up dupes for a color revolution, page 105. The United States could play multiple roles in facilitating a revolution by funding and helping organize domestic rivals of the regime, like the um, terrorist organization, the MEK, the United States could create an alternative leadership to seize power. As Raymond Tanter of the Iran Policy Committee argues, students and other groups, quote, need to covert backing for their demonstrations. They need fax machines. They need internet access, funds to duplicate materials, and funds to keep vigilantes from beating them up. Beyond this, the US media outlets could highlight regime shortcomings and make otherwise obscure critics more prominent. The United States already supports Persian language, satellite television, Voice of America Persian and radio, Radio Farda, that bring unfiltered news to Iranians. In recent years, these have taken the lion's share of overt US <coughs> funding for promoting democracy. <coughs> In Iran. US economic pressure and perhaps military pressure as well can discredit the regime, making the population hungry for a rival leadership. Using military force to assist popular revolutions. Consequently, if the United States ever succeeds, in sparking a revolt against the clerical regime, Washington may have to consider whether to provide it with some form of military support to prevent Tehran from crushing it. This requirement means that a popular revolution in Iran does not seem to fit the model of the Velvet Revolutions that occurred elsewhere. The point is 
that the Iranian regimes may not be willing to go gently into the, that good night. Instead, and unlike so many Eastern European regimes, it may choose to fight to the death. In those circumstances, if there is not external military assistance to the revolutionaries, they might not just fail, but be massacred. Consequently, if the United States is to pursue this policy, Washington must take this possibility into consideration. It adds some very important requirements to the list. Either the policy must include ways to weaken the Iranian military or weaken the willingness of the regime's leaders to call on the military, or else the United States must be ready to intervene to defeat it. Fomenting a military coup. Mounting a coup is hard work, especially in a state as paranoid about foreign influence and meddling as Iran is, for good reason. The United States would first have to make contact with members of Iran's military and likely its security services as well. This by, this by itself is very difficult. Because of Iranian hypersensitivity to Americans, the United States would likely have to rely on cutouts, third-party nationals, working on behalf of the United States, which invariably introduces considerable complexity. Then the United States would have to use these contacts to try to identify Iranian military personnel who were both willing and able to stage a coup, which would be more difficult still. It would be hard enough to Americans to make contact with Iranian military officers, let alone make contact with those specific individuals willing to risk their lives and their families in a coup attempt. Of course, it is possible that if Washington makes very clear that it is willing, trying to support a coup in Iran, the coup plotters will reach out to the United States. But this is very rare. History shows that coup plotters willing to expose themselves to another national government are usually discovered and killed. Furthermore, most of those coming to the United States to ask to help for help in overthrowing this or that government tend to be poseurs and even counterintelligence agents of the targeted government. So there we are. Uh, so uh, I think uh, there's enough evidence to show that um, the policy has not changed one iota since then. Um, and uh, probably um, it's a combination of the ineptitude of the people that are carrying this out, as well as the fact that people have finally wised up to things, um, that this is um, unlikely to succeed. So who do we have supporting military action uh, against uh, Iran? I think we have Apart from the United States, we have the United Kingdom, Europe is against, uh, we have Israel, we have Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. And with that, I would imagine the list uh, would, uh, well, that's the end of the list. So, obviously, this is uh, an attempt to try and build up uh, a popular perception and a perception in the in the so-called international community to support uh, military action against Iran. Um, so I think that's all pretty um, pretty conclusive evidence in my mind. So. So that's enough from me. That's uh, Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under.